All right, so back on the uh, Freedom Flux array here, um, some parts came in. You can see this is the uh, carriage strap. It's got the little hole punched in it to screw onto the carriage. Um, so in an effort to reattach that, um, I tried feeding it through in from uh, this side because the spring thing is down in that back corner back there. So I tried feeding it in from that side and just going all over the place. So I realized I would have to take the carriage off to feed it through. Um, which ended up being kind of a complete nightmare. Uh, the carriage um, doesn't slide off. Uh, you can actually see uh, these two pieces right there and there. This guy and this guy are the stops for it. And I've got it tipped up, the whole assembly tipped up now. Um, so those would only be on the bottom. And if you look up through the bottom of the machine, you can see them and maybe you could reach them with a screwdriver, but getting them back on again would be almost impossible, I think, trying to go up to the bottom of the machine. Uh, so I opted for this option, which was to try and take the whole carriage with its rails off. Unfortunately, that's impossible because, well, not impossible, but very difficult because, um, I'm not sure if you can see, but right here are a bunch of switches that are uh, wired in, so you'd have to take all the wires off of those, which you could do, but it's just, rather inconvenient. Uh, you can see all the levers sticking out here and here and over there. Um, those will have to be detached for it to even get lifted up into this state. Uh, you can see back there I've got the uh, tab stop switches. Uh, those I had to take off because the cables were too short um, to lift it up like that with those still attached. So I just took it off and I set them there. Those guys interact with this board this goes on the back of the carriage. You can see it has these plastic tabs you can put anywhere you want. And then as the carriage slides along, it interacts with switches on that block there to um, tell the machine to do different things. I guess you can set that up in the plug board somehow. Um, so anyway, I've got that up now. Uh, I wanted someone to turn on the camera before I put the strap back on and put it back down. Kind of see what's under there. Um, it's kind of weird the way this machine is put together. Like I think I showed in the last video how on the bottom bottom of the machine the whole um, keyboard sense switch assembly, that whole block kind of just unscrews with two screws and then tilts it out of the way. Super easy to you know swing out of the way to get at the other stuff, but that's like really the only thing they made easy on this machine. Um, oh, one more other other thing: the relay board also hinges back. Uh, when you take out two screws, but that's about it. Um, the assembly over here, which I've got in pieces for the um, the keyboard controller, that was pretty difficult to get out. Um, not sure if I mentioned, but you have to take the belt off of this because otherwise you have to take the entire um, roller on the bottom out, the key drive roller, because the belt doesn't come off that shaft. So you have to take the belt off of this shaft, which means you have to take the, um, let's see, well that was good for it. This thing here is supposed to bolt on this piece, but you have to take that, either loosen or taking completely off to slide the belt off the end here. Um, that was not very easy to get off. Um, I actually had to end up loosening the coils so I could move them out of the way to get a screwdriver in to get to one of the screws. So that was rather inconvenient. Um, I don't know. I'll explain how this works in a minute. Um, I mentioned the carriage assembly was not easy to get off. Um, to go to front, you can see this bracket here. So I think you can see that. Hopefully, you can see it on the camera. Uh, this bracket here bolts all the way down in the bottom there. So you have to lift the machine up and take that bolt out before you can lift the carriage off the top. So um, and of course you gotta fight in, reach down and soon and fight with all these little levers to get them disconnected. I'm sure reconnecting them is gonna be fun. So, yeah. Um, just fun and interesting that they made that one assembly so easy to swing out of the way and then like didn't think about making anything else easy. Just seems a bit odd to me. But anyway, um, now that as you can see the clock spooling order came in and it looks pretty nice except for one problem. Scale is off by about a factor of 10. So, um, yeah, this is the piece that broke off the other one. And you can see just that middle spiral is about the same size as the new spring. So 
Yeah, that's not gonna work. Um, kind of the problem with eBay pictures, you can't really tell the scale that easily sometimes. So, you know, from the eBay picture, yeah, it's a nice looking clock spring. It looks like it should work, except it's the wrong size. So, anyway, um, I managed to get the assembly back in there, that spring assembly. Um, I don't know how long it's gonna work. I think I mentioned in the last video, I ended up heating up the broken end of that spring and kind of curling it a little bit to give it kind of a, uh, like a hook end somewhat close to that. Um, it's not perfect and yes, heating it up probably messes with the metallurgical properties and you know, the end of the world is nigh, but um, best I can do, I mean, you know, it's not like that's a super common part I can't find. This is the only thing I could find for that and obviously that's wrong so um I'm just gonna have to see what we can do with that um I did try tensioning a little bit it does you know spring now because I don't know what's gonna happen when I tension all the way to the, you know the max tension that would be when the carriage is all the way over but um I need to get that strap on first and then once that strap is on I'll you know coil that up and then hook the strap on that and you know see what happens but uh, so I just want to show the machine in this state. Um, you can see it's got this whole drive shaft on the bottom of the carriage here. I still haven't figured out exactly what that's for. It interfaces, you can really see, but down, stupid tripod, down in there, you can see there's a, what am I pointing out? There's a gear right there that meshes with the gear on that shaft, and then that gear drives another gear. Which, dry, which is connected to like some kind of friction clutch or something, which then has a belt drive off the motor. So what exactly that's for, I'm not entirely sure. Um, because, you know, you, you have the clock spring um, to, drive, to pull the carriage, you know, over that way, and then you have the return strap, which you can see right there is, see, am I pointing at the right thing? Let me make sure I point at the right thing on the camera. Right there, that thing is the return shaft that's unhooked. Um, that, you know, is for the power carriage return. So what that extra drive is for, I'm not entirely sure yet. Um, see what, see about that, but hopefully it doesn't have to be timed because it's out of time now. But yeah, so um, another thing I've got some uh, Teletype tape here, and if we come over to the punch, you can see there's another problem. If I use this tape, I line, come on, I line it up with the holes there, you can see that if I use this tape, I'll be missing at least two bits. So, this is not the right tape for this. Um, I didn't know that there were different sizes of Oh, type tape. Um, and this one's actually my fault because the person that was selling this had it right on the list in the tape dimensions and I didn't even bother to check because I thought, well, teletype tape is teletype tape, but apparently that's not the case. Um, I thought that you were going to find some wider stuff. And um, yeah, but in the meantime, I should be able to I pop this guy back on. So the more and more I work on this, the more I wonder whether it's worth um, fixing the typewriter portion or just going for the punch and reader portion. I'm going to put one in for now. It's got dowel pins, so it's going to be aligned. Um, let's just try. I'm not sure this is going to... Yeah, I think that's the right way. So the idea being, if we turn this this way, I think. This way. It's not in drive mode. Here. 
punch it? Yeah, I punched it. I don't think it's going to work too well. I'm not exactly sure how you're supposed to load it because when it's like this, there's nothing to grab the tape because these uh, interface with these holes here, but when you don't got holes, it's got nothing to grab. So, um, give me some little bit, but. There you go, it's got two holes anyway, so um, I'll have to play around with that. Um, there should be a way to release the other punches, because probably there's just like a relay or something that will release, you know, each individual punch as you turn that over. So I might play around with that and just, you know, make sure all the other punches are going to work, but um, yeah. Uh, first punch is in, who knows how many use. So. Got to find new tape, got to see if I can fight the carriage assembly back in once I reconnect that strap and then see if the swing is going to work. And then I have to reassemble, um, let's see, let's go back over here. So this is basically a mechanical uh, binary decoder. So you can see each of these things here has basically a bit pattern on it. Um, so you can see like these ones, each column has certain ones that are lined up straight and there's certain ones that are kind of bent over off to the side. And those interface with these guys, these racks um, represent, you know, each rack represents one bit. So these can either slide over or back um, there's something to poke that with. So you can see the, um, those relays here are solenoids, um, and they have a little catch here, so if I trip this one, you can see that rack jumps over. You get a little spring there, and I can reset it and it latches in. So, uh, <clears throat> whatever you know, bit pattern comes in, it'll trip certain ones of these racks, and then that will, whatever racks are tripped, um, so if a rack is tripped, I believe it will mesh with the bent over ones. So I haven't actually confirmed the alignment, but I'm thinking like. Like these bent over ones, I'm thinking if you know this rack in this position trips, I'm thinking that will align this pin with maybe not. I don't know. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the direction is, but basically the pattern here corresponds to a pattern of tripped and not tripped racks. So thinking when all the racks are not tripped, that should not allow. That should not. Um, match up with any of these, um, and like say, you have one that's just with one tooth, I don't really see one, um, but anyway, so like this one's got three that are this way and three that are that way, so maybe, you know, if um, these racks are stationary and then these racks trip, and then, you know, that one's stationary and that one trips and so on, um, that will mean that none of the pins here will be aligned with a pin on the rack assembly, which will allow this to move in, basically. So if I do a cycle on this and you can see I think right here, right about there is the start of the cycle. So you can see all these are pushed back flat against the back of the case. Now as you start the cycle, you can see this bar rises up and then all these are allowed to rock forward. Now normally they wouldn't all rock forward, only one of them would rock forward depending on which one is not aligned with any of the pins on the racks. And then that one will rock forward and then you can see this bar 
well, has dropped down now that these are forced out of the way. But this bar is spring loaded. So basically, once that bar gets released, so it will push down. But basically, it will push down on. Probably because it pushes down on that little tab there, which I can't easily reach. There's a little tab here. We'll push down. Maybe. Yeah, so you can, when I push down on the hook, you can see that tab moves down. So, what's going to happen is normally these all start pushed against the back, it will release them. All but one of them, or if there's no key being activated, none, but in the case of one key being activated, all but one of them will be blocked by one or more pins on the wax, except for the one, which is not aligned with any of the pins, that will lock forward. Then this bar will be released, and in the spring tension on this bar will push down on that one, activating the hook, which will, of course, grab the um, key shaft on the keyboard and activate that key. Um, but I'm not really going to be able to demonstrate it when it's a part like this, but um, mainly because this is under spring tension, so when I'm trying to push all of them down, this doesn't have enough spring tension to push all of those down, but when it's just one of them, it should be able to push it down. Um, so basically that's how it works. There's a separate uh, solenoid for each rack, of course, and whatever bit pattern comes into those solenoids trips those racks, which then line up with these um, fingers here, and, and that's basically basically about it. Uh, this, these are sensors here. There are cams here that act and act with sensors. You can see on this side, uh, these rollers run on those cams and then activate switches. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what what all those do, but for some reason the machine needs to know whatever state this is in. Uh, as it's doing its thing, but yeah. Oh, and then also there's yeah, is that in frame? This thing here, um, which rides on this thing. This this rides on this cam, and then this rides on a little pad on that. That pushes all of these back to reset them at the end of the cycle. Um, so overall, it's a pretty simple idea, really. Um, just got your, you know, one solenoid per bit, activates the rack, aligns with this, and then um, once these are released, only one drops forward, and then the spring tension pulls down the hook, and that's basically how it works. Um, but yeah, I think I explained before that this, see, is that in the frame? This is a, some kind of spray clutch, I think. Um, so normally this will be held back, and then this will be allowed to rotate freely. Just some kind of stiff, so I have to get some, some more grease oil or something in there. It actually has a grease fitting that goes in the end. So up the, you know, this is actually a grease fitting that goes in the end of the shaft, so I'll have to you know, fill it up with grease um, and put it back together. But yeah, so normally when this is held back, this is allowed to rotate freely, and then when this is released, it kind of Oops, I'm going the wrong direction, maybe. Yeah, so when this is held back, this ought to rotate freely. It should be freer than this, so I'll have to get some more lubrication in there. And then when you release that, then it engages and drives the whole thing. So, uh, same kind of setup on the uh, card punch and the card reader. Um, this Frame. It's shooting on the floor is not not easy. This thing here is a solenoid. It's actually two coils, um, and this is only sprung up. It pushes on this little tab right here to hold this back to free it, um, and then when this drops down, that releases um, that tab, and then it engages the drive. Um, that's basically how that works, and that's the reason why. I felt comfortable taking this out because when I realized that it has that clutch like that, um, I knew that it couldn't be timed to anything else in the machine because that clutch can be engaged 
any point, so there would be no uh, timing relation. So that's why I took that out. Um, and additionally, um, I think I mentioned that some of these are actually misaligned, but this whole thing was all seized up. So that's, I think, what the issue was. Where I think I mentioned before when I was turning it over my hand, it's kind of like a stiff part and then it kind of clicked past. I think that was this tab clicking past this uh, relay stop um, because it was just so seized that this wasn't able to release the clutch. So turning the belt kind of just manually forced the whole thing to um, you know keep going and pushed right past this stop. So um, you know, I was like, I gotta get some more lubrication in there, but it is freer now. So um, hopefully we'll be able to put that back together. Um, and put it back in. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is without this in, it makes the machine a lot less stable to have up on its back. Um, and when I was putting the uh, spring valve back in, I took the motor out and that made the machine really unstable to have on its back. So I uh, just got to be you know, extra careful when doing that. Um, that's another thing that makes it less convenient to work on because you, know, you kind of have to, you have to take this stuff out, but the only way to take it out is with the machine standing up like that, and then when you take it out, then it makes it a lot less stable, so it's just really inconvenient. But anyway, uh, I do have to fix the wires still. Um, I'm gonna see if I can figure out, you know, if they go to two solenoids that are next to each other, um, I'll see if they go to pins that are next to each other on the um, connector, so I can kind of deduce, you know, which wire goes to what. Um, like, you know, if, you know, one of them goes to solenoid one, one of them goes to solenoid three, and I trace back and find that, you know, pin one and pin three go to the other end of the wires, then I'll just, you know, assume that, you know, pin one goes to solenoid one and pin three goes to solenoid three and you connect them that way, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, I got a few more things to do here. Um, see if maybe we can get some uh, typing done. All right, so as you can see, I've got this mostly back together with the exception of this thing. Um, reason being, so you can, well, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see this, but all the way down in there, there's one coil. You can see there's supposed to be another one, and you can, um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see, there's a little yellow wire down in there. It actually broke off that coil. I don't know if I did that when I took it apart, um, because this thing was a pain to get off of here, and I had to get that off to get the belt off. Um, I think I found a way now to partially put that back on, and still be able to get the belt back on, um, just keeping one of the screws out. But the way it was on there, I couldn't get to one of the bolts because the head of it was so messed up. I'm not sure if I showed this before, but the head of it was so messed up. I don't know where it is now, but it's around here somewhere in this mess. Um, actually, it might even be this. Here we go. So the head of this was so messed up, I couldn't get a wrench on it the way it was in there, so I had to actually use a screwdriver, but I couldn't use a screwdriver because the coil was in the way. So I had to loosen up both of the coils and kind of move them over a little bit to get at that screw. Um, and maybe that's when it broke, or maybe it's already broke, I have no idea. Anyway, the point is, I took the insulation off of it. You can see here, that's the inside. You can see the, the tunes there. Um, and I was able to find both of the ends, and I cleaned them up, soldered new wires to them, and it was still open. So I took even more of the insulation off, which is how you see it now, and I found that it was actually broken in two places. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to see the other one now. Um, let me see what it right, it right where it comes out of the um, let's see it right there, that little, little strand, that's the other end of it. So, um, it's actually broken in two places, and once I took the rest of the insulation off, the piece I was trying to sell it to just fell out because it was disconnected there. And a couple of issues, um, this, I don't know, I'm not sure what sort of enamel they use on this wire, but normally you can uh, tin, you know, this real fine magnet wire, just by running it through a blob of solder on the soldering iron, it just kind of you know, burns the lacquer off and tins it. This doesn't do that. If you run this stuff through a blob of solder on the soldering iron, it like just kind of burns and you know gets crusty, but it doesn't actually burn off and it doesn't tin. So I found that, um, you can see I, I need to get that, that piece to kind of shiny. So I found that 
once you do that and kind of burn it until it gets crispy, then you can kind of scratch it off and get um, shiny copper like I have here. However, that's not going to be possible here. The piece that's sticking out there was twice as long as it was before I tried to tin it. And when I tried scraping off the lacquer there, it's kind of, you know, broken half to what it is now. So, um, I think this is going to be a write-off on this coil at least. Um, I'm still going to put this back in so I can use it as a typewriter um, because right now that's the easiest way I have to at least test the card punch. Um, since the, you know, the, the sensors and everything on the bottom of the key assembly is already set up to, you know, encode properly for, you know, going into the card punch and having that punch, not the card punch, the tape punch rather, um, that would be the simplest way for now at least to see if the punch will, you know, operate, um, rather than trying to reverse engineer the wiring and rig something up to drive that. Um, since the machine's already set up to drive it, I would rather just see if I can get the machine to drive it, um, at least for now, see what it's, see what it's going to do. Unfortunately, we won't be able to test the card reader without this, because the, this is what the, the card reader controls this, and like this is then connected to the keyboard to drive the keys. So, without this being in operation, um, we won't be able to test the card. I'm calling it a card, it's a tape reader. The tape reader, we won't be able to test the tape reader um, without this, unfortunately, but. I just hopefully we'll be able to test the the tape puncher. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to um, screw this back on the side just so that it's in place um, because it will keep this disengaged. Without without this on here, this will be continuously operating, which we don't really want. This is not going to be doing anything. So. And it, when that operates, it sends, I mean, I guess I could leave it unplugged. I am going to leave it unplugged because I'm not going to hook up that wire again. I'm going to leave it unplugged, so actually these switches won't be confusing the machine because they won't be connected. But anyway, I really don't need this thing funking around the entire time if it's not being driven. So, um, yeah, I will just put this back on. Um, so that will keep that disengaged. I can put the belt back on. Um, it would be a lot nicer if they made it easier to take the belt completely out of the machine. Um, but unfortunately it's stuck on the shaft that runs through the, the rubber um, patent drive for the keys. Gonna have to take the shaft out of that to get it off because it's trapped by the frame. I think I showed that earlier. Anyway, just kind of unfortunate. Um, I kind of want to blame the design here too. Um, one, they should have made it easier to get the belt either off of here or off that other shaft easier than having to take this off. And two, they should have made it easier for you to get at the screws without having to take those coils out. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, just going to put that back in. And then I've got to go through and fix all the contacts on the relays before we can power it up. But I think this is the last mechanical thing I have to put back before we can power it up. Um, I, I think I mentioned that I did get, you know, I think I showed that when you push a key and manually turn it over, it does lift the, um, the stampers or whatever you call those. Um, and I did fix the um, carriage. Oh, maybe I forgot to mention that. Um, not sure what I discussed last in this video. Uh, I did get the carriage spring strap back on. Um, you can see it down in here, it's, it's got tension now. So the carriage advance um, spring is back in. Um, that was not easy at all to do. Um, I think I showed you too, I had this lifted up and I was trying to put it on that way. Um, I don't know what I, was, what I had this lifted up for. I thought I lift it up for something. Yeah, something. But anyway, um, oh yeah, I ended up to feed the stew, which ended up not being useful. Which is probably why I forgot why I did that. Um, so what I ended up doing was I had, um, I tried to tension that as best that I could and then try and like loop the cable around it one more time. Well, that didn't work. Um, 
So what I ended up doing is I ended up taking it off of the carriage here and then tensioning, um, I think how I did this. I tensioned that so it was had some spring tension um, with the end of the strap a little bit to the left of where it would screw into the carriage. So that way when you would, my thinking was when you'd pull it out and screw it in, then it would have tension in the, you know, the least tension position, basically. Um, so there's like, all, when the carriage is all the way over here in the zero position, um, or the other way around, when the carriage is all the way over to the left, that's when most of the strap is back on the coil, so that would be the least spring tension. So I actually had this, if we can, I think I mentioned this before, there's some friction drive in there that I kind of really just want to take out. I don't know why it's there. And it does stuff like that. Anyways, I had this all the way over that way, and I took the screw out and um, put some tension on the spring back there. So that way, my thing would be when I pulled the strap over and screwed it in, it would have tension in its, you know, furthest most over position. And of course, when you pulled it back way and unspooled the uh, strap, then when you have even more tension and everything would be fine. Um, that was my thinking. Somehow that didn't work. When I pulled this out and let it come back in, it lost tension, you know, maybe right about here. So what I ended up doing was because I had some extra length on the strap, I just pulled the strap out some more, poked a new hole in it, and screwed it in, and now it has tension in position. You can see it has tension here, so um, hopefully it will be good. Of course, I don't think I'd ever used the, the thing over this far anyway. It's really some kind of huge paper, but anyway. So, yeah, that was that. So what I ended up doing was, because I, had to t I took the screw out and let it back in there, I ended up using pliers from the bottom to try and fish it through and then grabbed it with vice grips to hold it and then pulled it out and screwed it in. That's what I ended up doing. Um, not the most convenient thing, but it's in now. So um, once that was fixed, um, I noticed that the machine would no longer trip the carriage ratchet when one of these risers came up to stamp the paper. So what's supposed to happen is when you push a key, these come up and then it trips a single step to move the carriage over one position. Well, that thing wasn't tripping, so after a couple hours of looking at it, uh, I finally traced it down to, uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see, this has to get released. Uh, this lever, right down in there, not sure if you can see that or not, but, um, I found out that the space key was working, so when you push the space key and then turn it over manually, it would trip that thing. So I looked at that linkage and found out that there was a rocking piece down here that a foot controlled by the space key pushes on a toe of that, rocks it, and that hits a plunger that trips the ratchet. So looking at that mechanism, I'm trying to figure out um, how the other keys linked into that, and I sit at it for how long, I couldn't find anything. And I looked at that piece and I noticed that there were two little fingers on it, almost like it would go in some kind of fork, fork connection like this. Um, so this thing here has two metal tabs on either side of this piece, and they have a hole in them, and this piece has pins on each side that go through those forks, and then they just kind of pinch on there, and that's how the linkage connects. So I noticed that that piece had two pins, like it should have some kind of fork on it like that, but I couldn't find anything in there that would connect to it. So after a while looking at that, I finally remembered that when I had this thing lifted up and was playing around with it, a linkage fell out. So I located that and determined that yes, that was supposed to be in there. So I finally wiggled that back in, which it was really difficult to get in that way with the carriage assembly already bolted in. But I really didn't want to take it back out because that was a whole process. Um, so I managed to get it back in there, and that fixed the issue. So that's this this linkage right here. You can kind of see the top of the. I think you can see it anyway. Hopefully, like right there, that linkage.
um, that trips the carriage advanced ratchet um, anytime one of these keys comes up to the pattern. So that's back in. Um, there was a linkage that I actually broke in there when I was taking this out because it was underneath the carriage and I couldn't see it, I didn't know it was there. Uh, and that is the backspace linkage. So right now the backspace key will not work. Um, and right now I'm not going to be too concerned about that because mainly at this stage in the game, I think mainly I just want to get this thing to operate as a typewriter and then use it to test the card punch. Um, with that coil being broken in the, I think they call it a reproducer is the Frieden term uses, the term Frieden uses, um, I think they call it a reproducer, that thing that controls the keyboard. Since that's not going to be operational, um, I'm not going to be too concerned with getting this to work perfectly. Um, so, yeah, let me put that back in, then I'm going to bend back all these relay contacts. Um, and of course, before I, you know, power it up, I'm going to have to install a cord and check to make sure nothing's shorted, uh, so it doesn't blow up when we turn it on. Um, yeah, and we'll see how far we get with that. Okay, so I um, went through and did a couple of things. I installed a new power cord. Um, the relays in the back that had the mess of contacts. I bent the mess of contacts in such a way that um, everything that looks like it should be normally closed is normally closed, and it's not shorted to anything that should be normally open. Um, I don't know, you know, and if any of those are going to engage um, when we turn this thing on, what's going to happen there, so we'll just have to see what happens. Um, I verified that there was not a dead short um, with the switch on in its static state, but you know, once you turn it on, you know, who knows it's going to engage or disengage, and who knows it's going to happen. So, it should be interesting. Um, I did do a temporary fix on the messed up return clutch, um, and I think that's actually what this spring that I ordered is for. I think this spring is the spring that's inside that return clutch assembly, so either the eBay listing was wrong or I misread it or something, but um, I'm thinking that's what this spring is. This is not the carriage advanced spring, it's part of the carriage return mechanism. Um, as you can see, I've got the pattern reinstalled um, with some paper there just because I'm extra confident. Um, well, I did reinstall that um, the yeah, binary, mechanical binary decoder thing. Um, under the keyboard. Obviously it's not going to do anything because the clutch isn't going to work, but um, it's there. Uh, I greased that. I greased the clutch on the t tape reader. That has the same kind of clutch and unfortunately, I didn't realize this before, but once you reinstall that decoder mechanism, you can't get at the grease fitting on the tape reader. So then I had to take the tape reader out just to grease that, which is kind of annoying, but whatever. Um, this thing here, um, so you can see that off to the side here, they had that broken, this thing, uh, it turned out to be a diode, you can see there. So I just stuck a diode on there real quick. That is the solenoid to unlock the keyboard. I don't think it really works properly because the keyboard seems like it's unlocked most of the time anyway, but this mechanism here is supposed to be the keyboard unlock, but I don't think it's adjusted properly because I don't think it's actually engaging the lock, but We'll see what happens. I'll just put a diode on there just, you know, for whatever. I didn't want that old thing to explode. Um, so yeah, I think we'll do a power-up test first. Um, then I'll go lift this up and show a couple things on the bottom. Um, it does have two circuit breakers. You can see right there. Um, they were not tripped. At least I don't think they're tripped. I think the state I have them in now is the set state. I was say they were when I got it, so I don't think they were tripped, unless I have it backwards and they were both tripped. Either way, um, yeah, let's see what happens, shall we? Should be interesting. Oh, the motor's on. I don't think any of the relays engaged. Keyboard is locked, I think. Just so I can hold this. Yeah. Of course, I don't have a ribbon because the oh, it stopped advancing. So this piece is not working. This 
engagement thing here. The relay is not pulling in. So it is somewhat locked. Let's hold the lock off. So, partially working with the carriage is not advancing. Oh, there it went once. So I don't know whether something just misadjusted there. Hey, yeah, we got one key. One key types. I only think these keys are going up all the way. Only that P key actually hit the pattern. That's messed up. Come on, get back up there. So S key is messed up. That one was slow. That key doesn't do anything. That one sticks down. That one sticks down. Oh, there it went. That key doesn't do anything. Oh, there it went. Sticks down. Um, let's see if I can pop it back up. Do we do try upper caps or lower caps? Doesn't do anything. Try tab. Doesn't do anything. I locked up the keyboard with this. Stupid tab key. Um, so I'm not sure what I was expecting here. Um, like I, said, I think the main thing I'm going to use this for is not as a typewriter, but as a first test driver for the tape punch. Um, so the fact that these keys are starting to type, or at least trying to type, the P keys don't even actually type anything. So I don't think these are going up all the way, but I think it should be fine because the mechanism that drives these is the same thing that pulls the switches for the um, binary encoder that hold the mechanism on the bottom. Um, so as long as these are coming up, that should be enough to engage those switches to send the signal to the punch, I'm hoping. Um, one thing we can also try is the tape feed button over here. I'm assuming that just engages the tape reader to just feed through. So. I'm going to push that and watch this roller here see if it does anything. It does nothing. Okay, so either that's broken or that's broken or some signal flow through the messed up relays is breaking something. Obviously this machine is not completely correct because like I said, this solenoid is not engaging. So, um, probably what I should do is figure out where a, um, test point would be for the DC um, circuit voltage that runs through all the control circuitry. Maybe we just don't have any control voltage to anything and the only thing that's working is the motor and then of course the connection between the keys and the the stampers here is all mechanical so um, or it could be possible we don't have any you know uh, DC control voltage or electronic voltage, whatever you want to call it, to drive the control circuitry. We don't have anything anything at all for that, I don't know. There were two dials in the bottom and I checked they weren't shorted and they are good. So um, got a you know, 0.5 volt drop one way and open the other way. So those two dials are good, but you know, could have a bad cap or maybe one of the circuit breakers is bad. You're not letting voltage through to the, um, the DC circuitry. So got a couple of things to check. Um, at least we know that the motor runs and you know, the keyboard will work hopefully at least to control the punch. We're going to use it to test that. Um, I'm not going to flip any of these switches because I don't know what they do and I don't want to potentially engage some of those relays and you know, who knows what's going to happen when those things try to engage in their current state. Um, but yeah, so at least it didn't blow up. Um, so I'm hoping at least the tape feed would work so we could, you know, make sure that would verify that we've got you know, control voltage everywhere and the we were actually going to do something but to do anything so i uh, got to figure that out um, so got to reattach the punch um, remember those uh, rubber mounts are all broken I have to figure out how to we're gonna reattach those and then once I get those reattached we can put the punch back in and see if that's going to do anything um, I think this switch controls the punch I think um, I was looking online, I was looking through an older manual for 
one of the older machines, I think, and at least when it's in read tape mode, it was saying that this switch will determine whether it's re-punching. Um, so maybe this also controls whether it's punching during normal typing. I'm not exactly sure. I'll have to figure that out. Um, of course, I have no idea what any of these switches do either. Um, so, you know, the reason I can't put a ribbon in here is because if you look here, it's got this support and this support are the ribbon holders. But over here, the support's on the side of this box, and this box is so bashed in that this pin is up here, the other pin's all the way down there. So it was like, you know, this pin has moved down like an inch from where it should be, so I can't mount a um, ribbon holder in there. And for the matter, I only have one ribbon holder of the right size for this, this older style metal one with the ratchets on the outside. I only have one of these because the machine only came with one, and this one's pretty messed up, so, um, yeah. I don't think it really matters, so like I said, um, I'm not going to care too much about using this as a typewriter, um, given its state, and, you know, I have you know, other mechanical typewriters, like the uh, IBM Model 01, which I have a video about several years ago, um, which mostly works. Uh, anyway, so, yeah. At this point in the machine, mostly just looking f towards using the punch and the tape reader for, you know, just to play around with those and not really caring too much about the typewriter section of this, but at least it turns on and doesn't blow up, so we're getting somewhere, I guess. Um, like I said, the only key that actually reached the page was the P key. All the other keys are somehow stopping before they get there, so I'm not quite sure what the issue is there. But like I said, I don't think it really matters. Um, I didn't try carriage return. Backspace, uh, we know it's going to work because I broke the linkage for that. Um, which could be fixed, but I don't know, I'm going to really worry too much about that. Um, so yeah, let me flip this up and I want to show a couple things on the bottom. Okay, so as you can see, I've got this is that mechanical binary cutter. This is the bottom of it. Um, I just stuck the connector down here. I'm not not plugging that in um, because it's all messed up, you know, with the. I didn't even reconnect these wires over here to the solenoid since one was missing. So that's just sitting in there to hold this belt because you can't get this belt um, out without taking the shaft out of the whole rubber roller in there. So. Um, it's kind of a bad design in my opinion. Uh, as far as the carriage return, that's my that's my temporary fix there. I just put a zip tie around the end of this broken off lever here to kind of hold this in place so you can see it's not engaged. Um, it's got play there so they can still push in to engage the clutch like that. Um, but before, because this is broken off, this was kind of flopping off and if I turn it on at that rate, because this whole thing spins around the whole time, um, I think it does. Maybe not. Maybe just... You know, I think actually just the cork uh, clutch disc is what spins, and this is actually stationary most of the time, so maybe I probably could have just taken this off and taken the disc out and left it at that, but oh well. Um, which one off for power up anyway. Um, as I mentioned before, this is the um, binary encoder, so it takes one of, you know, from the keyboard, basically a one of two you know, the 8 bits or whatever, how many of they use, I'm not exactly sure, um, through these switches. So, um, anytime one of these gets pulled up, that will send out a bit pattern um, via, I think I showed that before, via these switches here. It engages a certain number of switches for each key is a different combination. Um, so, because it's at least flying the keys up, it should be pulling these to switch these. So, we should be able to get a binary pattern out of the keyboard and see if it makes it over to the punch and then if the punch is going to punch, which hopefully it should. Um, you know, we showed mainly turning it over is punching the index hole. So the rest is just whether or not it's the solons are going to engage the other thing. So um, hopefully we can use the keyboard to test that. Um, now I got a question about peripherals for this from Ed from the Ed of Ed channel. I think that's what these connectors here are for. I believe um, these are just set up right now to be like a loop back. You don't have any connected, but I think you can take these blocks out and then plug in your peripherals into either one of these uh, slots, whether it's like a computer if you're using this as a terminal, or if it's the um, external uh, auxiliary tape uh, reader machine that they made for this, or whatever else you happen to have 
I think they made hard drives too. And I don't know if they made the hard drives for this or those or just for um, their like computer workstation things. I don't really know. Anyway, so I think um, I'll have to figure out what the pinout is for one of these, but maybe we can just directly connect into here um, and then use the tape punch and the tape reader that way. Um, but we'll have to see. Um, of course, you're going to have to run the whole machine because the motor runs everything. So if you don't have the motor running, you're not going to get any action from the tape punch or the tape reader. But um, so yeah, I, I believe that's where the peripherals connect is to either one of these blocks. You just take these jumpers out and then, I mean, this is a whole block, so this whole thing should come out. And then you plug in your peripheral there. And I think these are just loopbacks, like I said. So these are the two diodes here. So uh, as I said, I did check that these were not shorted and they are good. Um, but I'll have to double check and see if we get any voltage of the control circuitry. I see a selenium rectifier there, which I didn't check. So, you know, who knows, maybe that's bad. Um, yeah, so, so let me pull the punch over here. So you can see this assembly here is the same deal as the clutch on the other thing. It has the, the two coils in the back there. I'm not sure if you can see both of them. One's kind of hiding down in the bottom there, but basically that same idea. And then this thing spins. You can see this thing spins freely until this clutch is tripped by the solenoids, which I'm not sure if I can get my finger in there to do it. There we go. So once that clutch gets tripped by the solenoids, then this makes one rotation and then it hits back on that clutch and then the spag releases and this thing spins free. Obviously you have to clean that up because it's all full of the old nasty grease here, so it's pretty stiff, but that's the basic idea and that's why um, those coils are there. Why they use two of them, I don't really know. Um, and you can see obviously we got the grease fitting in the end here. Now, right here you can see is the same setup for the tape reader, the same clutch with the, the coils right there. You can see one of them. Now the grease fitting is all the way up in there. I don't even know if you can see in there, but all the way up in there is the grease fitting. And there's a hole through this frame member, so I guess that what they want you to do is take this whole thing out, then you can get a grease gun up in there to grease that grease fitting. That seems pretty dumb to me, to have to take this whole thing out just for like a routine maintenance to grease it. Um, whatever. Um, just another thing, you know, like I mentioned this machine, it doesn't seem like they designed it too easy to work on, except for this which swings out. This just has these two thumb screws here and here, and the whole thing swings down, which I think I showed in the last video. And that's super easy, but then they made up for it by making everything else super difficult. So, I don't know what the deal is. Anyway, um, I think that's going to be about it for this video. Let's see if I can get my tripod set back up here. But, yeah, I think that's going to be about it for this video. Um, we know that it'll power up. We know that the mechanical typing part of it works well enough that we should be able to use it to test the... Uh, tape punch. Unfortunately, we'll be able to test the tape reader because this thing is messed up, so we'll have to figure out how to get signals out of the machine before we can test the tape reader, or at least test that it's reading. We can maybe try and test that it'll advance paper, but um, actually test if it's reading properly, we won't be able to do that until we figure out how to get signals out of the machine, but um, I think that's about it um, for this now. I don't think there's anything you really do in this video. Um, all right, before we can move forward, I gotta reattach the those rubber mounts for the punch. We can try that out. But and probably while I'm doing that, you know, before I do the next video, see if I can figure out how to get something out of this. See if I can figure out why the tape feed key is not engaging the reader at least, because I, I think it should. I'm not too sure about that. But so yeah, a couple things got to be figured out. Um, I guess I gotta remount the punch and then. Once that's all done, hopefully in the next video we'll be at least, you know, somewhere ready to test the punch, at least anyway. Yeah, you either test the video too, but yeah, so a lot of stuff to do off camera, figure out that stuff out. And in the next video, hopefully, it will be ready to at least punch. So, hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching.